Hey everybody, Matt Colville here. So you want to challenge your party with a solo monster for whatever reason. Maybe you want to make the wilderness seem dangerous and so a creature is going to erupt out of the earth and scare the crap out of your heroes. But you don't want it to just be a speed bump, a combat with no stakes and afterwards it felt like a waste of time. Because often in these scenarios, the heroes are at full elf, as Matt O'Driscoll says, and can use all their abilities and be pretty sure they'll be able to rest afterwards. That's called Going Nova. The heroes, with all their abilities ready, able to use all of them without fear, and if you're like me and you have more than four players at your table, you need a really tough monster to challenge them. Well, but do you though? See, that's the problem we all have. If we're going to challenge our players with a lot of monsters, the game works pretty well. If we want to use only one monster, or even one big boss with a lieutenant and some minions, then we need a tougher monster. So we grab a higher CR monster. But that makes the battle really swingy, meaning it swings wildly and unpredictably. The heroes pound on the monster, and because there are so many heroes and only one monster, the heroes do a ton of damage. And then one of two things happens. The monster dies without ever getting to do anything, the definition of anti-climax, or the monster acts. And if it was tough enough to survive the entire party pounding on it, then it's really nasty. And when it attacks, it will probably kill a character. That is not fun. So that's the problem. A challenging solo monster or boss can't be about toughness. Because the way the game is designed, any monster tough enough to survive the heroes pounding on it is nasty enough to kill them. And toughness... It's not, it's not interesting. It doesn't make for an interesting battle. That battle I described, where the heroes all pound on an enemy while it does nothing, then it acts and obliterates someone, is boring. It's a boring battle. So we need new design, and that's what I've been working on, and it really is design. This video is about building better solo monsters, and it's not a system where you pick some options and you get a finished monster. It requires us to be designers and invent new cool abilities, and that requires you to think like a designer, which if you're a DM, you already are acting like a designer, you just might not know it yet. I got a whole video brewing on the virtue of homebrewing your own rules and design, so you'll see what I'm talking about. This started when the Chain of Acheron were going to fight their nemesis, the Black Iron Pact. This is a team of enemy PCs, a wizard, a rogue, a cleric, a monk, etc. And I really wasn't looking forward to designing six 11th level PCs from scratch because one, it's a lot of tedious work, two, most of which isn't relevant. Like, I, I don't actually need to know their stats. I just need to know their attack and damage bonuses, which I can just make up. I can just say, this dude has plus nine to hit with this weapon and be done with it. I don't need to know how he got that plus nine, and I really don't need most of their skills. Three, it would produce a party that is insanely hard to run. You know, just a single high-level cleric can be a lot of work for one player to manage with spells and channel divinities and class abilities. One person running six high-level PCs? Forget about it. Finally, four, I, I don't think it would have produced a fun battle. People act like D&D is symmetrical because monster stat blocks look sort of like character sheets with stats and skills, but it actually is asymmetrical, which is why most monsters have multi-attack at levels where the PCs are only attacking once. And lots of monsters have access to abilities the PCs can never get because they need those abilities to challenge the PCs. If we make monsters follow the rules of PCs, the fight becomes slower and more of a slog. So instead, I focused on actions. I sat down and made up six different NPC villains and came up with actions, bonus actions, and reactions for all of them. Often, custom abilities I made up. And then I gave them villain actions, which is basically legendary actions from the monster manual. I gave them unique abilities they could use at the end of other characters' turns. Not reactions, new unique actions. Then, because I wanted the battle to feel like a story with a structure and flow, I made sure each of these villain actions fired on a different round. Round one, the rogue's villain action fires. Round two, the monk's villain action fires. That was an incredibly successful design. It worked. It was an immediate hit with the players and the audience. It gave the battle character. It was never boring. It was never a slog. And because these bad guys weren't like CR 17 monsters with 270 hit points, they weren't just high AC and tons of hit points. The heroes actually made progress. Heroes and villains went down almost from round one. This also was amazing because people talk about how hard high level D&D is to run. Well, the Black Iron Pact is like 11th level and it was easy to run them. It was fun and it could be easier because this was a new design and I learned a lot. 
So that's what we're gonna do. That's this video, making better solo monsters using action-oriented design. It requires you to invent new abilities, but we're gonna do these together so you can sort of get the hang of it. And to make things easier, we're not gonna invent new creatures from scratch like I did with the Black Iron Pack. We're gonna pick two existing monsters and adapt them. Maybe we'll do another video after this one focusing on one or two entirely new monsters. Stay tuned. We're gonna do a boss and a solo monster. A boss is a really nasty epic enemy, but he has some underlings to boss around, so it's not literally the party against this one enemy. A solo monster is actually just one monster versus the entire party. And because I want this video to be broadly applicable, we're gonna pick two monsters you might expect to fight at third level. A goblin boss, it's got boss right in the name, and an unkeg. And all my notes are linked in the doobly-doo. Starting with the goblin boss, we first need to get into the right frame of mind. And that means thinking about goblins. What are they about thematically? because these themes are going to tell us what kinds of actions our new goblin boss can take. Well, they're pretty feeble. They don't have access to awesome spells or great gear, but they're crafty and mobile and rely on strength of numbers. So our goblin boss is going to be about using his many goblin minions. His weapon is his goblins. First, we're gonna buff his AC a little, but not too much. Third level characters can easily have plus five or plus six. So AC 17 is a challenge, but lots of attacks will still hit. And super high AC is not good design because missing sucks. More HP is better, so let's give our Gobbo boss more HP, a lot more. He's got 67 hit points. Basically the same AC and hit points as a bugbear chief, so there's precedent. Maybe a goblin that tough doesn't make sense to you because goblins aren't this tough by definition, in which case you could just call this monster a bugbear. So some people will just ask, okay, why not just use the bugbear chief and be done with it? You will see why. We leave the movement and everything else alone. We're gonna be concentrating on his actions. First, he needs things he can do on his turn, normal attack actions. Let's give him multi-attack for three scimitar attacks. Normal goblin boss gets two, but the second one is at disadvantage. That's funny, but it's not a lot of help to us. So multi-attack for three scimitar attacks takes care of his melee attack. He needs a ranged attack. Doesn't matter how tanky your monster is, it needs something for range, even if it's really short range. Goblins use javelins. Let's give him two javelin attacks. So multi-attack, either three scimitar swings or two javelin throws. At this point, pretty bog standard boss monster. And you could give your boss a spell, like a cantrip or even a first level spell they can do every round. Why not? Monsters in the monster manual mostly get spells like PCs do with lists of all the spells they know at each level using the logic from the player's handbook. And that is terrible. We're dungeon masters, we want options, but too many options means we sit there wasting time trying to find the optimal choice. And ain't nobody got time for that. A CR 10 guardian naga knows 15 spells. Yeah. That's great if I'm gonna run a Guardian Naga PC for the next 20 hours and 10 encounters. But for one battle, I can't be having with looking up all these spells to figure out exactly what they do, so I'm making sure I'm casting the right one in the right moment. Nah. So a spell your boss monster can cast as an action every round, no problem. 15 spells, too many. Now we get to the meat of this design. So far, all we've done is make our goblin boss more like a bugbear boss. Starting with his actions, we begin focusing not on his stats, but what he can do. Let's give him a bonus action. Lots of PCs have bonus actions. Why not our Gobbo boss? What would be a good bonus action? Well, I thought it would be cool if your goblin boss could call on reinforcements. Like once in battle at a critical moment, a bunch of goblins show up. But timing that right is hard to build into an action because this guy might not last more than three rounds. So let's make his bonus action, another goblin shows up. Yeah, that's right. Every round this guy attacks someone and shouts, get in here, and a goblin arrives. That is already super cool and I'm excited to run this guy and see the player's reaction when they realize every round a fresh goblin arrives. Now, I might decide these are goblin minions, identical in all other ways to a normal goblin, but they only have one hit point. That depends on how many goblins the PCs can kill per round. If they can kill more than one gobbo per round, I might decide these are normal goblins. And I'm free to just decide, well, there are no goblins within earshot this round and lay off that ability. Where does the goblin show up? Like within a certain range of the boss? Uh, does it appear adjacent to a PC? I don't know. I'm not worried about that. In the moment during the battle, I will decide based on the terrain and what makes sense. I'm not here to make more work for myself. I just wanna come up with some dope goblin abilities. Because here's the trick. This is my homebrew nonsense. This isn't a published rules set. I don't have to worry about how this action is worded. I only need to know how it works. And I already know how it works. He shouts, get in here and another goblin arrives. Done. 
But we got lots more actions to cover. What about a reaction? Lots of PCs have reactions. Reactions help keep a fight dynamic by giving monsters things they can do on the hero's turn. But there's a trick to this. Remembering what triggers your monster's reactions and then recognizing that trigger when it happens is more mental overhead. So the best, simplest reaction is reacting to stuff your monsters do. That's easy to remember. Next, you could react to things that any PC might do, like move or attack or cast a spell. That's pretty easy to remember. Still legal, but much harder to keep in your head is reacting to specific things your PCs do, like use inspiration or smite someone or spend a key. You can invent reactions to these things, and it can be really cool. You know, the anti-monk who reacts to the monk spending a key. That's dope. But this was the problem with the Black Iron Pact. Everything worked except their reactions because one, there were six of them, and two, their reactions were very noodly. So I forgot them. Lesson learned. Our goblin is going to react to one of his goblin minions dropping unconscious. He's gonna shout, you die when I say so, after a goblin drops unconscious and the goblin regains one hit point. He's prone, but alive, and can stand up, move 15 feet, and attack on his turn as normal. This is another cool, fun ability I can't wait to use that reinforces the theme of the boss using his minions. A goblin boss's weapon of choice is more goblins. And it may seem like a big deal, but he can only do it once per round. If a goblin dies each time a hero acts, only one of them can be brought back. Now, we could decide this doesn't happen automatically, the goblin has to make a save, but think about how long is this battle gonna last? Maybe five rounds? Probably three. So we're talking about bringing about three goblins back to life. If there's a save required, now maybe only two come back. Maybe none. So that's up to you. I originally thought, yeah, let's give this a saving throw, but now I think, nah. That's another part of this design. I often come up with a bunch of abilities I'm really excited by. Then as we get close to game time, I start to realize, uh, maybe I've overdone it and start to dial it back. That's fine. That's part of the process. That's normal. Don't think it has to be perfect the first time you write it down. Don't think you can't change it as you go. You absolutely can and should. Okay, so we've got a bonus action and a reaction. Now we need some villain actions. Villain actions are basically just legendary actions for our villains. They're neat things our boss monsters can do at the end of another player's turn. Not reactions. There's no trigger other than, oh, you're done? Okay, the goblin boss acts. Using villain actions is a key to this process because it makes the battle dynamic and fun but I tweak the idea of legendary actions a little. I key each villain action to a specific round of combat. In other words, we're gonna come up with three villain actions for our goblin boss. He can do the first one on round one, the second one on round two, etc. This gives the combat shape. It gives the combat pacing. It makes the fight more of a narrative and it keeps the players engaged. What the hell is he going to do this round? And if I'm smart and a good designer, the villain actions know what round they're used on. In other words, first round villain actions should be neat, but not devastating. It's early in the battle. Let's not obliterate the heroes out of the gate. And first round villain actions probably should focus on positioning because the battle just started and our boss wants his minions to get into position. Then by the time we reach our third round villain action, we know the battle is almost over. Probably a lot of our minions are dead. Let's do something really amazing. A, a League of Legends ult, basically. So what are our goblin boss's villain actions? Well, this isn't a shaman or a spellcaster, so we wanna stick with using our goblins, which means just moving and attacking mostly, and this is a restriction. But keeping our villain actions themed to our monsters is important. If any monster can do anything, then they cease to feel like distinct challenges. So round one, goblin boss villain action, let's concentrate on positioning his minions. At the end of some PC's turn, the goblin boss shouts, what are you waiting for? And every goblin gets to either move or, since some of them are probably already in position, attack, not both. And we should rule that this movement doesn't provoke opportunity attacks, but that's dealer's choice. You may want your players to get a chance to hack down some of these minions, depending on how many goblins you're using. Basically, if you're using a ton of minions, let the heroes get attacks of opportunity on this movement. Otherwise, it defeats the purpose of getting our minions into position. This will really wake your players up. This is not a normal monster. You can see how these actions, he can make new goblins with a bonus action, he can move his goblins as a villain action, really make him feel like a boss monster, a genuine challenge. The players are going to have to think outside the box to win. And we got two more villain actions to do. I think regardless of how many action-oriented monsters you intend to run in a single combat, even an entire party, like the Black Iron Pact, you only need one villain action per turn. More is too much to track and, frankly, too much for the players to deal with. 
Goblin boss, round two. Well, everybody got into position last turn, and the battle's been going for over a round now. The boss knows who the most vulnerable PC is, and also probably who is the most important PC. Let's let him react to that. He points at a PC and says, focus fire, and all goblins may move to that enemy. Again, this movement does not provoke. Now it's up to you to decide which goblins should I move. You want to leave some behind to fight the other heroes, and some goblins are probably already in melee with your target. The goal is to make this PC feel surrounded by actually just literally surrounding them. Note, these goblins don't get a free attack or anything, it's just movement, just positioning. This is tactical. Just being where you need to be so that you can attack who you want to on your turn is huge. And this ability is good for two reasons. My goblins are now where they need to be, and also you may be literally surrounded and unable to move. Okay, so we got two abilities. What's the last one? Well, the danger is to go overboard and do something ridiculous. We want something simple but effective, and it's close to the end of the battle, so there probably aren't a lot of goblins left. So our goblin boss shouts, KILL, and all goblins get two scimitar attacks. On the one hand, this is very simple. Just everyone left alive and adjacent to an enemy attack twice. But this can literally wipe the party depending on how the battle has gone so far. Mind you, there's no movement associated with this, so no positioning. Some goblins will be standing there sadly unable to kill. But that's also the point. It needs some restrictions in order to stop it from being overwhelming. 100% this will be a memorable battle. That is the point. This is not something we deploy casually. It's a system we use when we really want to challenge the players, but we want the feeling of a powerful singular villain. Okay, so that goblin boss is pretty cool. I would be excited to use it, and I'm certain the players would have a blast fighting it. But a boss monster has minions and maybe a lieutenant or two. What if we want a solo monster? Literally just an entire third level party against one monster. Well, let's pick a monster the players are likely to fight alone, like an Ankeg. Onkegs are perfect because they're exactly the kind of thing we expect the players to fight as they're wandering around the wilderness, and maybe you just want a monster to punctuate the journey. Okay, just use a normal Onkeg. But I often want to really challenge the players in this scenario so they feel like the wilderness is a dangerous place. Probably this creature is not part of a series of encounters the players will be dealing with in a single day, which means they will be able to go Nova on this monster, use all their abilities freely, knowing they'll recharge again before anything else happens. So this Onkeg needs to be nasty, but not just a bag of hit points. Let's get started. Step one, what is this creature? Well, it's sort of a big insect thing, isn't it? It's got a carapace, it gives it some armor, it's got big mandibles and claws, which for some reason the monster manual entry doesn't consider worth noting. It can burrow underground, and it has an acid spray attack. Plenty to work with. The goal is to make abilities that are cool, but fit what the players would expect a creature like this to be able to do. That's the challenge, and that's why we start by just getting a sense of what the monster is about. We start with AC and hit points, and because we're adapting this monster to survive an entire party pounding on it for a couple of rounds, it's gonna need more of both. AC 14 is way too low, but we still want folks to be able to hit. Missing sucks. So let's bump it up to 16. For a third level party, that's still totally hittable, just a little harder. Hit points, we really boost. 39 hit points is nowhere near enough. I mean, this assumes you've got like six players. If you have three or four, it's a different story, obviously. Unlike the goblin boss, this guy doesn't have any minions, there is literally nothing else for the players to do but pound on this thing, so I'm gonna give him 86 hit points. You might think, good lord, that's too many, but it's only one more than a displacer beast, which is a CR3 creature, so we shouldn't be freaking out too much. It can move 30 feet and burrow 10 feet, but I don't think 10 feet is enough for my purposes. For one thing, I assume it needs to spend five feet of movement just going down one, which only is five feet of movement to go over one to get away from the heroes. So let's double his burrow speed to 20. This creature leaves a tunnel behind it, so it's not like its burrow ability makes it impossible to track or follow or attack, and 20 feet means the heroes can easily jump in and go after it, and it's a large creature, so two people can stand abreast in his tunnel but 20 feet of burrow gives him enough movement to make the decision to jump down into the tunnel and follow a little more dramatic. Your allies on the surface won't have line of sight with you down there, and since only two of you can stand adjacent to it in the tunnel, the tunnel acts as its own challenge, greatly limiting the force the heroes can bring to bear. But that challenge is purely opt-in. No one needs to go down into the tunnel. Will they? Of course they will, but it's on them. Let's modify this guy's senses a little. He's got eyeballs all over his head based on the art, and they must do something, so let's make him immune to being flanked. Flanking giving advantage is an optional rule, so this isn't universally useful, but it's cool. Now we need to give him some actions to use on his turn, and we want to make sure he has some melee and range. 
I mean, it's got this cool acid spray attack, but it's on a recharge of six, which means it's probably only gonna fire once. And the art shows him with these massive claws, which the stat block ignores. Well, we're not gonna ignore it. So instead of a bite, we're gonna give him a claw claw bite. And when we figure out the damage, we'll make sure the bite is nastier. The bite can grapple. That's great, we're gonna keep that. But it would be nice if the claws did a little something something. So if both claw attacks hit the same target, the target has to make a dex save or be knocked prone. I might add uh, and be knocked back five feet because prone is pretty useless, but that's up to you. The fact that both claws need to hit and you need to fail a dex save means this isn't gonna happen very often, but it doesn't need to. It's mostly just spice to make his melee action more interesting. Let's give him another action, which is just two claw attacks, but with 10 foot reach. This is gonna give him slightly more utility in combat and make it hard for people to sit back in the second rank. And his third action is his acid spray, which I'm inclined to leave as is. He's gonna have plenty of other stuff to do when we're done, so recharge six isn't a big deal. He should have a bonus action because the heroes do, and what's good for the goose is good for the gander. His bonus action will be a free claw attack on a prone enemy within 10 feet. This isn't that big a deal. I don't think bonus actions should be epic, but it can create a fun little combo where he claw claw bites, knocks someone prone, and then claws that guy again, adding insult to injury. The claw attack shouldn't be a big deal, maybe only a d4. He gets plus three from his strength, but remember, we don't need to follow those rules. We can decide he only gets two thirds of his strength with his claw attacks. We're trying to challenge the players, really push them, not wipe them out. Now our solo insect beast is going to get three reactions, and that is a lot. It's a lot to keep track of, but I just had three cool ideas and why not? You can only take one reaction per turn, so we have to remember that. But when you're only running one monster, I think keeping this stuff in your head is easier. I wanna give our acid insect more things to do with this acid. So let's give him an acid glob attack, which is a reaction to an enemy leaving their space. Someone moves, the Onkeg hurls a glob of acid. It gets an attack bonus, and if it hits, the target has to make a save or they're stuck, and the acid does some damage. Maybe they're only stuck for one round. And this is a reaction to leaving their space, so you don't have to wait for them to finish their entire movement. Soon as the party's striker moves, you glob them, and they're stuck for a round. Second reaction, more acid. Someone hits him in melee, they crack his carapace, and get sprayed with acid. Acid for blood. Classic xenomorph nonsense, everyone loves that. Now, I might limit this to only working the first time someone hits him rather than every time, but since his first round reaction is almost certainly going to be acid glob, we need to allow this to work later in the battle. And probably what I would actually do is I would say, screw it, he can take two reactions in a turn and say the acid for blood reaction only happens once, the first time he's hit. Last reaction is reacting to dying. It's death throws splatter acid on everyone nearby. But let's say only within 10 feet, we don't wanna go crazy. Okay, three reactions is a lot, but it's really only two on the first round and then one at the very end, no big deal. Now we need some villain actions, one for each of the first three rounds. First villain action, simple, it burrows into the ground, awesome. It erupts out of the ground, surprises the heroes, attacks them, one of them finally gets to hit back, and then it dives underground, very dramatic. It will definitely surprise the players. It doesn't really do anything, it just changes the conditions of the test, which is great. You thought you were gonna stand around bashing this thing until it died, but the first thing it does is run back underground and lurk, daring the players to jump into the tunnel it leaves behind, A plus. Maybe it grappled someone with its jaws and now they're down there with it. Villain action two, second round, it burrows under someone and pulls them under. Ha, now the squishy wizard or ranger who thought they'd be able to stay in the back are down there with the beast, awesome. Another ability that doesn't do any damage just changes the battlefield in favor of the Onkeg. Finally, villain action number three, it clenches its muscles and sprays acid out of all the wounds the heroes have made in its carapace, spraying everyone within 30 feet like an acid sprinkler. This is a good final ability. And unlike his other villain actions, this is some real damage, real danger. That's it. Now we have an Onkeg ready to take on an entire party and maybe make them think about retreating. It has range, melee, it has a lot of positioning abilities, and it has lots of ways to leverage its acid attack. It has a lot of abilities, three reactions, three villain actions, but each of these is only going to happen once. You can actually list them in terms of which round they happen to make it easier to run. I don't know, I haven't tested this, but I believe this would be a memorable encounter. And if it ends up being too nasty, I can dial it back on the fly without the players realizing I was doing anything. I mean, he is pretty badass. Depending on your party makeup, number of players, he might legitimately annihilate a third level party. But here's the thing, uh, this is basically a random encounter. Heroes on their way from point A to point B and this thing just erupts out of the ground. So the heroes can just leave.
There's no moral imperative to stay in a fight, and they're probably invading its territory, it's just defending its home. That being said, if they stay in a fight, I'd make sure there was a lovely tunnel leading to its lair where some awesome loot from previous adventures was stored. Only fair. Now, you've probably already noticed that I haven't bothered to work out what these creatures' attack or damage bonuses are, and if I were about to run these creatures, I would absolutely do that. But whenever we talk about numbers, some people start freaking out. And that's not what this video is about. It's about building monsters by focusing on their actions and making sure they can do many cool things in combat. The attack and damage bonuses you can figure out on your own. There's a table in the Dungeon Master's Guide, page 274, I think. I've used this method a couple of times, and it's pretty common for me to ballpark some attack and damage numbers and overshoot. Then right before we start to play, I look at the numbers again and I go, uh, that's too much. So don't feel like you have to sit down and figure everything out in one go. No one does that. You'll work out some numbers you believe in, and that's your first draft. Then later, before the game starts, some of those numbers will look wonky to you, and you'll tweak them, and that's your second draft. And this process never stops. You, you run the game, and you realize that some of the numbers needed more tweaking, and you remember that for next time. And every time you run, and every time you cook up a new monster, you're learning and redrafting. That's it. That's the action-oriented monster video, which is based on a live stream we did, and folks who were there for that and who watched the battle against the Black Iron Pact have since used this system and reported back great success. It's not simple. It's not a function where you pour in some numbers and grind away and out pops a result. You need to use your imagination and do some of your own design. But that's part of the fun of being a DM, designing your own nonsense. And like everything else, the first time you do it, it might be crap. It will literally be the worst monster you've ever designed, because it's the first. You'll get better every time you do it. Thanks for watching, folks. If you want to support the channel, we got a store with a dope shirt in it and our 5e supplement strongholds and followers. We're launching a Kickstarter for Kingdoms and Warfare real soon. There's a link below to get an email alert when it launches, and you'll probably see this system used for the new monsters in Kingdoms and Warfare, of which there will be many. Until next time, peace out.